Hello and welcome to another episode of The Fitness Solution. Now, I it's been a while since I got this done and that's because work has been absolutely crazy. It's been so nuts, it's not even worth me talking about, which is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, of course. Um, but keeping on top of everyone on the Strong and Confident program and my responsibilities in the gym that I now working and stuff like that, I've not been able to get one of these done, not since uh, the last one I did, which was similar to this one, because today I'm gonna to talk you through another one of my blog posts. Uh, it's one of my most popular blog posts, actually, and it's called How to Stay Full in a Calorie Deficit Without Being Hungry. Now, if you listened to the last episode, you'll know that I'm starting to do these as YouTube videos and as podcasts, because I've had a lot of people say to me that the blog posts are just too long for them to be able to listen to, uh, sorry, for them to be able to read which is fine, and I think it's some of my best content. So if I make it audible, and um, if I talk to you in this manner about it all, then hopefully, just hopefully, um, you're going to enjoy, you might enjoy the information that I share, and therefore you might enjoy, um, you might learn something, which is basically what it's all about. Um, what else has been happening in my life? Uh, not a lot, really. I've just been cracking on. I've overturned my website a little bit. Actually, I'll tell you one thing I have done. Um, if you are if you have any kind of interest in knowing and understanding what online coaching is, um, like the kind of results you could expect or what it's like with people I work with and stuff like that, then I, I recently recorded a new video that's on my website. If you go to my website, www.thegymstarter.com, and then if you head to uh, the coaching tab on the Strong Confident Program, then there's a video on that page. And I took a load of snippets from uh, like the weekly and monthly forms that clients on the Strong and Confident program do. And from those snippets, I produced myself a, um, a video. I like just reading them out basically, just so you could kind of see more inside the kind of work we do, the kind of things that you, the, you can expect when you work online with someone because it's still quite an unknown thing. And one of the things that I find with most people, one of their big worries is that they're not, they won't go and work out or is that they're not um, gonna be able to do it or they're worried about their form and stuff like that. And so I thought grabbing a, a real selection of everybody's opinions and you can see really how I work with people individually um, and how they're all on their own path in their own little way and your path would be very like that. It would be your path in your way. I thought it'd be a nice thing to share. So that's on my website. Feel free to go and have a watch of that. And that would be absolutely lovely. Right, now to get on with today's topic. How to stay full in a calorie deficit. Now I wrote this, <laughs> I wrote this actually, this, this post, um, and it's another reason I'm doing this video as well. I wrote this post when I was listening to my business coaches and they were praising a load of people who'd done it. And they're like, you know, this person's is number one on Google, this person's is number two on Google, this person's is number three on Google. And I just didn't, like, and mine wasn't, and I, was, I got really jealous. I was like, ah, I wanna be on there. So I wrote it and now I'm number one on Google with this post and I'm hoping the YouTube video will then come up top and it's basically the competitive person in me, aside from the fact that this is really good content and it's really important to understand how you can stay full whilst you're in a calorie deficit because that's difficult. Like a sign of being in a calorie deficit is hunger, okay? And, um, and that can be difficult and many people will think, oh, I just need to be in a calorie deficit and they'll keep trying to eat the sausage rolls and the, I don't know, the, the, the chocolate bars and the crisps and, and they'll try and restrict their calories but they're constantly hungry because they don't know how to balance all of those different things. And so it's my job to basically help teach you how to balance all of those different things. And that's what this blog post is about, okay? So now we know within weight loss, the calorie deficit is the only tool when it comes to weight loss. In order to lose weight, you must be in a calorie deficit. And if you don't, know what a calorie deficit is, then go to my website and find all of that out. But at this point, if you've listened to enough of me, we should know where we're at with that, okay? Um, and then the point is, is that we need to learn how to make this work. How to make sure the calorie deficit doesn't get in the way of your results, but it actually helps your results. 
Um, so that's basically the point of this. Now, there's just a little addendum I need to put into this, okay? Um, the body, the body is a very clever tool. Um, I think addendum is the right word. I'm getting hung up on that. The body is a really, really clever tool, and it has what we call a settling point or a set point, and and that means that the set point in terms of your body weight is where your body is happiest, and it is a hard thing to change. Now, it can be changed. But one of the easiest ways to change it is to actually change your overall environment. It's not just like get into a calorie deficit, but th think of it like this. Um, the environment, our body is a pure reflection of the environment we live in. And so, for instance, if I was to take you and you wanted to lose some weight, if, if I, but you stayed where you are right now and you weren't able to lose weight, then that makes sense. And, sorry, it's my boss who just walked in and I think I gave her a fright. And then, um, and then, uh, that was a settling point, yeah. But then if I was to take you and put you on a desert island and put you in a completely different environment, different food available, different situations available, different stressors, maybe no work, then you could imagine that your body would probably settle at a different point. And that's what the settling or set point really is. Your body adores being where it is right now. It's happy, it's in what we call homeostasis. And to shift that dial, is really really difficult and your body is going to fight you every step of the way and it's not fighting you because it hates you or because you're broken or your metabolism is broken or anything unless you have a metabolic condition your body fights you because it just likes protecting you it wants you to be um happy it wants you to be where you're at it wants you to stay right there and I mean, just look at my body. I don't change body weight much, okay? That's because I have a couple of things available to me. But one of those things is I, I just know my routine and I live almost constantly in my routine and therefore my body is really happy at 80 kilograms. Even if I go out and referee um, on the soccer fields or football fields, if you're English, it's amazing how much being Australian is getting to me. Um, and I'm running like, at the minute I'm doing, if I'm doing four games in a weekend, I'm then doing close to a half marathon every weekend and my body still doesn't like, I'm not losing a lot of weight at that because my body, and then I then feed the food my body needs or requires in order to keep it where it's at. And I feel really strong at 80 kilograms and I'm okay with that. I've, I've uh, what's the word, made my peace with the fact that I'm probably never gonna look like, I don't know, uh, Hugh Jackman. But even Hugh Jackman doesn't look like Hugh Jackman. So that's fine. Um, I'm just happy where I'm at, and that's great. Um, and it takes time to change these set points. It's not easy, there are ups and downs, but you can do it if you really want to. And this is why dieting is hard. This is why people do feel incredibly hungry when they're in calorie deficit. And this is why I am doing this podcast for you. So the blog post is separated in certain things. Number one, it says how much food should you eat in a calorie deficit to help with hunger. Then what foods should you eat to help with hunger? Then other foods that will help with hunger and then other tips and tricks to help with hunger. I think you can see the, the, crucial, um, the crucial theme on this. So let, they're the four points I'm gonna cover. So let's crack on, shall we? If that's okay with you, dear listener. How much food should you eat in a calorie deficit? Now, I'm sure you're reading this or listening to this because you have an understanding of how a calorie deficit works. And you probably know the numbers you're trying to work towards, okay? But if you don't, then this is how I set up calorie deficits for all of my clients. I give them an upper window and a lower window. Now, I set their, um, and I give them a window because I want them to understand that, like, it's a target. Like, we, we, we only need to get into a landing zone. We don't need to get into a... Um, we don't need to hit a perfect number. We just need to be in and around all the time. And fitness is that like everything is gray. There's no black and white. There's no, I must be on 1600 calories a day. No, you could have 1800 calories and you could have 1500 calories. And if you're somewhere between those two numbers, you will lose weight. That's not you, this is a theoretical client. Um, so I set the window 
as their basal metabolic rate, which is about 70% of their overall metabolism. So that's their real minimum amount. That is the least amount I will ever let a client eat. And that's because it can be sustainable, but it's also not the most sustainable, if that makes sense. So sticking to your BMI is probably fine when you're in routine, but when you're trying to stay into a calorie deficit and you know, you have parties to go to or socializing to go out to. And, you know, when things get in the way or Sally brings donuts for a birthday in the office, then I like to make sure that we have a flexible upper window too. And that is your goal body weight in pounds times by 12. Your goal body weight in pounds times by 12. And that's obviously provided that you've given me a realistic goal body weight to begin with. And that's a whole other topic. Now, the point here is that I'm always going to encourage people to eat more food. Many of them, when they start working with me, will go for the lowest number. And that's because they think that will give them the quickest result. And they're not wrong. It will. It will give them a quick, short, sharp result. But you must remember that if the methods are unsustainable, the results are unsustainable. So going for that quick win could end up causing you so many more problems further down the track. And that is why you must resist the urge to go, oh, I'm gonna lose a kilo a week and put myself into a ridiculous deficit. So we want you to eat more food, higher volume food, so that being in deficit is as easy as possible for them. You may well have seen the TikToks, you may well have seen all of the other social media posts that is like, I lost weight by eating more food. They did, but they actually ended up eating less calories. That's because they were eating more higher volume foods they were eating foods with less calories no surprise fruits and vegetables and then what they were doing was they were they they didn't feel the need to snack as much they didn't feel the need to go for chocolate bars and potato crisps and stuff like that because that's weird potato crisps you can tell i'm like in between two societies now can't you i'm trying to cling on to my english self with the crisps part of it and then like the australian american potato chips coming in, oh, it's ridiculous. Right, um, you wanna eat more food as much as possible because if you want to learn how to lose weight and keep it off forever, then you will need to do this as well. You need to start understanding that it's not about how little you eat in terms of food, it's about eating more but trying to keep those calories in a place that's gonna work for you. And that is the real balancing act of a calorie deficit along with loads of other stuff but for this particular topic. Um, and and that the ultimate goal, if I haven't made this clear at this point, is to eat as much as you can within your numbers. That is the aim. You want to eat as much as you can to thrive, not survive, not eat as little to survive. And this is about you being your best. Now, there is no way in hell you're gonna perform your best, you're gonna feel less stressed, you're gonna have lower anxiety levels and things like that if you are just literally trying to eat the bare minimum amount to survive. I've seen what 800 calorie diets do to people and it is not fun. It destroys your relationship with food. It destroys your energy levels. It makes you tired, stressed, panicked, confused, frustrated. The point is, is that you need to eat as much food as possible that pushes your numbers to the absolute max, yet you know will still help you lose weight. And we know that because we have the science to help us, guide us. So now, what foods should you eat to help with your hunger? Rather oddly, over the last couple of days, I, oh, well, when I wrote this, I had a TikTok post go quite viral. Um, and the aim of what you're going to eat should be quite clear. More food. The question remains, how do you do that without necessarily increasing your calories? So I would suggest we start with protein, the weight loss superfood. Um, I'm sure you're aware that protein is a very important aspect of your diet. And we can often get very confused about protein, how much to eat, or should we just eat loads and loads of it? Um, and I know when I first started tracking food, uh, which I haven't done a lot of, but when I did, I was very confused because my protein was never the largest amount in my little pie chart on my fitness pal. And I was like, but protein's so important, it should be the biggest. And then it wasn't, and I used to get really annoyed. 
and carbs would always be the biggest. But that makes sense. That's how that that's how it's meant to be, okay. Um, and it's really useful to us protein, but it doesn't need to be the, all you eat. It doesn't need to be the majority of what you eat. It just needs to be in the right place for the size of your body. And that's about 1.8 grams to 2 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. Um, which, it just sounds like horrible numbers. So, in my life with my clients, what I've done is I've simplified that even more. And I now just say, look, let's just get 100 grams a day in. Okay, I almost don't care who, what size you are, who you are, how much you're training. Um, let's just go for 100 grams of protein and make that a habit. Then if we can make that a habit, because protein's really hard to get right. If we can make that a habit, that 100 grams, we know we're up with that. Then we can start to increase. If you go for like 160 grams a day without ever taking it, so let's say you started on like 40 grams a day. That's like two chicken breasts. Um, and then I told you to increase to 100. You're going to find that really difficult. Now, if you were already struggling with your diet and you was on 40 grams of protein a day, and I said to you, now let's go for 160, you're going to look at me like I am insane, and rightly so, because that's poor coaching. So I would always suggest we start at 100 grams. That's our first aim. That's our first level. And for most people, that will be more than enough. And if you're vegetarian, take 20 grams off of that. So go for 80 grams. And then from there, we can build if we need to, but you probably wouldn't need to. And protein is really important because it helps maintain muscle when losing weight. Um, it's like, I always say like, if you eat muscle, you get muscle. Uh, I'm vegetarian, so I don't eat chicken breast anymore. But that's how I always viewed it when I wasn't, when I was an omnivore. Uh, I was like, I'm going to eat the muscles of an animal and then I'm going to get muscles, sort of. Okay, So it helps maintain your muscle when you're losing weight by keeping your protein levels at the right point. It will keep you fuller for longer. So protein uh, takes longer to, for us to digest. That's kind of all you need to know on that. Um, but that means that we're not going to get hungry as quick. And it also reduces hunger um, and your appetite because it reduces ghrelin in your body. And ghrelin is the hormone that tells us we're hungry. Um, and that's kind of the start of protein there. Uh, like, you know, I'm sure you know what your protein sources should be but chicken breast turkey breast steak kangaroo i've never eaten kangaroo but it's very lean uh, i've heard it's quite tough um and it's good you know like so a chicken breast you're looking at 165 calories and that could be about 30 grams of protein turkey breast 28 grams of protein 189 calories steak a little it's higher in calories steak because it's higher in fat you get about 26 grams of protein from that then you'd have fish again the fats increase in the fish so tuna steak um, is quite good actually, it's about 132 calories. Salmon, 22 grams of protein, uh, but it's 13 grams of fat, and then you've got about 208 calories. Dover sole, which is really beautiful fish. This is really quite lean fish as well. 18 grams of protein, but 89 calories, because it only has one gram of fat. That's really, really good. Or there's halibut, uh, which is 22 grams of protein, but you only get two and a half grams of fat and that's 115 calories. So you can see like they're like the, the best of the bunch in terms of fish um, for protein to fat to calories ratios. And as you can see, like we're having to balance all of these things. Like when someone only eats steak for, I, I really don't recommend it because obviously it's red meat um, and also I'm vegetarian. But when someone only eats steak for their protein, like they're gonna struggle because they're picking up 19 grams of fat as well. And the calories compared to eating like it's nearly a hundred extra calories compared to chicken and turkey breast. So that's why we always say, let's go for leaner meats, plus all of the other stuff about saturated fats. Um, and then dairy, you can get protein from dairy, 12 grams of protein in an egg. Um, but again, 11 grams of fat, it's about 155 calories. Uh, Greek yogurt, um, which is quite good, about 10 grams of protein. And whole milk, three grams of protein. Um, and that's per 100 gram serving. All of these are per 100 gram serving, sorry. I didn't uh, put that in there either. So, um, and then like think about it as well. Some people find milk filling, others don't. I find um, milk quite filling and I'm quite able to survive without being too hungry uh, on medium coffees um, with 
like in the morning for breakfast I'll just have coffee and the milk fills me up and keeps me going so that works quite well there also cottage cheese is a good option like protein yogurts are good options um, and then vegetarian if you're like me I eat tofu tempa lentils seitan I don't eat seitan personally but tofu tempa lentils they're all good sources of protein um, yeah and again you know you, you, you're looking around there especially with tofu and tempa about 12 grams of protein per 100 grams and seitan's about 25 grams of protein but it's a very specific uh, kind of food and it doesn't always agree with everyone so just be careful with it for me and then you can also supplement with whey protein or protein bars and they're very effective because you can get a lot of um, a lot of protein in like one like scoop of most protein powders are usually about 20 grams of protein and then protein bars as well are always quite good but the protein bars do carry a fair amount of fat um, so you pick up quite a lot of calories there and then if you go into my blog post on my website then I can't kind of tell you this bit <laughs> on audio but I've got like recipes from my uh, recipe books that you get if you become a client on the strong confident program with me um, and then you get all these high protein meals which are awesome uh, right now carbohydrates now Carbs are just demonized in our society and I don't really know why. Carbohydrates do not make you fat. Sugar does not make you fat. Carbs are literally a third of your diet and they are mightily important, okay? Annoyingly, the issue many people have with carbs is they're really damn tasty. They can be very high in calories um, and you don't get to eat a lot of food for that caloric amount. And remember, we're trying to make sure that you feel full after eating, not empty. So your best carbohydrate options will be the ones that are lower calorie, higher volume, fill you up for longer, as they contain more fiber too. And guess what I'm talking about there? Vegetables. Um, I always advise all of my friends online that I coach uh, to lean into their carbohydrate intake. If calories are hard to keep down, then changing up your carbohydrate source is one of the most powerful things you can do. Carbohydrates have exactly the same energy in them as protein. Let me say that again. Carbohydrates have the have exactly the same energy in them as protein at four calories per gram. So irrespective of whether you're eating sugar or vegetables, you're still picking up four calories per gram. The issue with carbohydrates arises when we only eat sugar and then we'll eat an awful lot of it at once. It makes us want more, which is why we begin to gain weight when we eat it and we get into these weird cycles of, of eating in that manner. No one ever got fat from eating too many fruits and veggies. And fruits and veggies are full of carbohydrate and they're full of fiber too. And that fiber keeps you full as well. Now my favorite sources of carbohydrates are sweet potato, potato, carrots, broccoli, tomatoes, and bell peppers or capsicums or whatever you want to call them. Um, and interestingly, potatoes rank as the highest satiating food on the planet, according to the satiety index. That's hard to say, satiety index. And you can see the difference between potato and, oh, you can't see it on here because I'm talking to you. But the difference between potato and sweet potato is negligible. Both have um, their own individual benefits. So sweet potato is 86 calories. Potato, white potato is 77 calories. You get 20 grams of carbohydrates versus 70 grams of carbohydrates. Um, there's a bit more protein in white potato than there is in sweet potato, and fat's exactly the same. Um, one other rule I like to kind of consider when it comes to vegetables uh, in terms of calories is that if it grows under the ground, it will probably be slightly higher in calories than if it grows above the ground. Okay, so that's why we always talk about leafy greens and things like this. Uh, because they've grown above the ground and therefore we can judge that they're lower in calories than, um, than yeah, stuff that's grown in the ground, like sweet potato, potato, carrots. Um, does broccoli grow in it? No, broccoli grows above the ground. Right, fruits per 100 grams per serving. So then there's fruits as well. You can have strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, banana, apples, watermelon, you pick whatever you want. And fruits are really powerful in filling you up and being able to fuel your workouts. I have a banana before nearly every single strength session I do, and I start most days with fruit, protein, yogurt, or I maybe now, because it's winter, fruit and porridge. 
Many of your fruits are incredibly low in calories, which means you can eat an awful lot of them if you need to, to cure your hunger. And they also come along with a big old dose of fiber. And that fiber helps keep you fuller for longer. And it's really good for your digestion. So why would you not eat those? Um, whole grains per 100 grams, oats, brown rice, white rice, bulk of wheat, quinoa, couscous, legumes, mixed beans. They're all good options as well for carbohydrates. Uh, again, calories ain't too high on them. Bulk of wheat might stand out a little bit. But again, the main thing with carbohydrates you need to remember is portion size. You have to be very, very careful with your portion size and be very, very ready to control that. That's the thing you need to control the most. And if you get that sorted, you'll be okay. Let's touch on dietary fats as well. So fats in themselves um, might not be satiating for everybody. And the reason I keep using the word satiating is because we're looking at trying to quell hunger. And that's how we establish it. How full does it make me feel after I've eaten it? It's a bit of a personal thing with fats. Some foods that are high in fats like nuts, they contain fiber and just like some of the carbohydrates I've outlined and therefore they might fill you up a little bit more. But fats have nine calories per gram in them. So when you start to pick those up in your diet, you will also increase your calories. Hence the issue with steak that I was talking about earlier. Fats are really important for our health. Like you don't need to avoid eating fats because they help the absorption of the ADEC vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And fats are also very useful for our cognitive function. Helps the brain go and regulate our hormones. So don't avoid them. Uh, there's many stories of people who really like cut out fats. They lose like their drive to have sex. They lose energy massively and stuff like that. And generally their, uh, their health will decrease. So they're definitely not to be avoided. Um, I don't mind a little portion of nuts in my salads. Uh, and I'll probably have an avocado as well with them, just to keep you ticking over. But they're not, yeah, we don't need to spend too much time on them in this podcast, but just so you know, fats exist, and there we go. Right, so there are other foods that will really help you um, stay hung, uh, sorry, stay full without being hungry when you're in a calorie deficit. And one thing that works really well here for me is high protein bread. So there's one here in Australia called Bergen Soy and Linseed. And you can get 15.2 grams of protein for 287 calories per serving. Oh, no, it's per 100 grams, sorry. Um, and then there's another one called Helga's Soy and Toasted Sesame Bread. And again, it's 280 calories for 15 grams of protein. And they're great options. They both rank high in the fiber department. Um, and many, many people, and I used to think this as well, think that bread is bad. And I used to actually say that to clients. I was like, bread is bad, bread is bad. I don't know why I used to say that. It was just one of these weird, freaky things that I got. Um, was oh, oh, I didn't tell you, did I? Um, just this week, I celebrated my sixth year as a personal trainer. I don't normally track things like that, but Twitter reminded me uh, that I've been on Twitter as the gym starter for six years. So I used to think these things, bread is bad. And then I educated myself and I'm happy to admit that I was wrong and I should never have said that to anyone. And I think they'll all forgive me. I hope they do. If you're listening to this, please forgive me. Uh, and it's just, it's part of the zeitgeist of the crazy world of health and fitness. But sometimes you can end up in rabbit holes without actually having the knowledge and you just believe what somebody else has said because you trust them and then it comes back to bite you on the bum. So I will happily admit, I used to say bread is bad. Now it's obviously not. Now bread is absolutely fine, like anything, as part of a balanced diet. And therefore, now I'm now in my head, I've got this thing that all you're gonna remember from this podcast is me saying bread is bad because it's such a, a uh, what's the word? Such a sound bite. Please don't remember the only thing from this podcast is that bread is bad because it's not bad. It's very, very good for you. Um, and it's full of fiber and it can be great. Obviously, browner or wholemealia is going to be a better option for you than kind of white refined bread. I'll happily say that, uh, just in terms of being more healthful, picking up more fiber, feeling better, controlling your glycemic, uh, your glycemic control, um, or your glycemic levels. I'll happily say that. But bread in and of itself isn't bad. And 
one of the nicest things to have on a cold winter's day is uh, white bread with peanut butter and jam. Oh, that's lovely. So, uh, other good options is zero calorie or very low calorie sparkling water. Um, like you can get some with flavor, some with flavoring in, but that kind of I don't know it's the bubbles just keeps you filled up. So sometimes I'll use sparkling water when I'm craving a beer at night or when I'm craving alcohol and the sparkling water will just um, get rid of that, that feeling for me. It's a great way of just managing myself in a better way. Um, and then low calorie pasta alternatives. There's one here, I think it's available in the UK as well called Slendia Spaghetti. That's really good. It's like got about four grams of fiber in it and it's like eight calories per 100 grams. I, 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 I almost want to say I don't know what's in it. It almost sounds too good to be true. Like, yeah, but whatever is in it. Sorry, I'm obsessed with sparkling water now and I've got one here, so I'm just gonna open it. Excuse your ears. I hope that wasn't too bad for your ears. And yeah, Slendia spaghetti or any of the Slendia range. They're not the most cost effective, but they're really good for low calorie and um, high fiber satiating food. Uh, they really are quite magnificent. And, and also like, it's a lot of food. It really fills you up. Like whenever we have spaghetti bolognese at home, um, we'll use Slendia and it, I've noticed no difference that it's not actual spaghetti. It tastes really good, it tastes really good. And then there's low calorie ice cream. But look, if you're having ice cream, just have ice cream. I don't think we need a low calorie ice cream, um, but those options are out there if that is a concern of you. Right, other tips and tricks to help your hunger. You can brush your teeth. I know it sounds interesting, but apparently brushing your teeth can remove the small food particles in your mouth and it stops them from playing tricks with your brain about how hungry you are, apparently. Uh, I, I, there's no study to back this up, but this is apparently what goes on. And I also, in my experience, I know there's something nice about brushing your teeth that kind of prepares you for bed and you're away, you don't want to be eating too close to bed, um, or too close to when you're going to sleep. So like there's something kind of purifying about brushing your teeth. Um, sorry, on this blog post, I've got a little gif of Stuart Little brushing his teeth and that's literally all that's buzzing in front of me right now. Um, and so maybe try that. Maybe just try brushing your teeth. I'm not saying brush your teeth 400 times a day every time you feel hungry, but maybe at nighttime, if you're feeling those late cravings coming in, then maybe just chill. Maybe just go brush your teeth and start getting yourself ready for bed. Maybe have some water. Ah, that was refreshing. Uh, right. The other thing is mindful eating. Now, what is mindful eating? It's such a buzzword, buzz term. And we probably need to um, go into this a little bit here, right? Now, being, being mindful is very vogue at the moment. And... It's not, it's not really a term I enjoy using, but it sums up what I'm about to talk to you about quite well, okay? So when you feel hungry, what you need to do is ask yourself this question. Am I actually hungry or am I just a little bit bored? Boredom eating is a form of emotional eating combined with stress eating, something which we all do. I know I definitely do it. Um, and what's really going on here is your inability to figure out and process the emotions you're feeling. Now, there's a great quote by a man called Victor E. Frankel that I have a habit of really cocking up every time I say it. And I put it on all of the, not all of the forms, but I put it on many of the forms that, um, that my clients fill out each and every week or month because I like them to be reminded of this quote. And the quote is, between stimulus and response lies a space. In that space lie our freedom and power to choose a response. In our response lies our growth and our happiness. So let's, let's just go through that again, okay? Between stimulus and response lies a space. In that space, lies our freedom and power to choose a response. In our response lies our growth and our happiness. So when we get that pang of, oh, I'm hungry, 
you have to take a moment ask yourself am i hungry am i bored am i hungry am i stressed am i hungry do i need a hug am i hungry do i need to talk to someone and you'd be amazed that actually when you start using these questions when you start investigating that hunger so much more what actually happens is you're not hungry you start giving yourself space and time and within that space you find a response that is actually more appropriate for how you're feeling a little bit of it is like being able to sit with uncomfortable feelings and a little bit of it is making sure that you're increasing your self-awareness because increasing your self-awareness is very important in your ability to understand your relationship with food that's really what mindful eating is if anyone says i'll oh, just be mindful ask them well, what does that mean what, what do you mean by that you know and it, it, they, they'll probably go down a path of like oh just sit with your food like be there with your food and, and that's true you should spend dedicated time with your food and that will help you feel less hungry further down because you spent more time trying to slow yourself down and you spent more time being with your food and therefore improving your relationship with food and and normally when we eat in a rush state we digest in a rush state that's just colloquial um and then we just look for the next thing we're constant and if we're constantly rushing we're stressed so lowering that stress level is what's really important about not feeling hungry later on down the track because it gives you the i don't know it gives you the space gives you the the, the pace i it just allows you to feel better and that's important so it's really an emotional question as well as a like a physical question in terms of what you're actually eating okay another good strategy will be to slow down as i alluded to earlier okay i eat far too quickly and whenever i do i'm always more unsatisfied than when i just took my time okay oh there is science associated with taking your time when you eat there's a hormone in your belly called leptin that's right of course there is and leptin tells your brain when you are full leptin isn't quick it can take about 20 minutes for the signal from your belly to be sent into your brain and within 20 minutes you could eat an awful lot more food so some key strategies to help slow you down would be put your fork down between each mouthful don't watch tv or sport when you're eating engage in conversation with your family at dinner table don't work on your lunch break try it see how it feels see how slowing yourself down if that makes you feel less hungry after the moment upon which you've done it and that is how to stay full in a calorie deficit without being hungry now there's a lot in there if you just go to my website www.thegymstarter.com forward slash blog um, just scroll around until you find the post and it will obviously come up for you um, it's not easy being in a calorie deficit for so many reasons that's basically the bulk of my work with clients how to manage all of their emotions how to manage their physical work how to manage all of these things and that's why we build really in-depth key relationships and that's why i always ask them these questions and that's why i write these blog posts and do these podcasts because always reminding them about these questions and reminding you about these questions about the management of what it is you're trying to do is as important as the actual doing it because as you'd know without the management of what you're doing it will just feel crazy so we must always manage it and learning all of these nuances is incredibly important you can be in a calorie deficit without feeling too hungry hunger is a sign of being in a calorie deficit so i'm not saying i'm going to eradicate it completely and nor should you expect that nor should you have that expectation but there are always ways of managing things to make things easier for you and nine times out of ten making things easier for you is also making you feel making you understand the realistic side and the realistic nature of what it is you are doing and by doing that by you fleshing it out and telling you my lived experiences or experiences of other clients that i work with and things like that then you understand that what you're going through is really normal it's not abnormal to you compared to what you see on the internet all of the time with everything and that's that that is this episode of the fitness solution i really hope you've enjoyed it uh thank you so much for being here 
please, if you want to work with me, reach out on my website. Filling, I've set up a new application form on there as well. It's a Google form. You just go fill it out. And it, it would be beyond my pleasure to work with you, to chat with you, and to help you understand all of this stuff in a much, 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 much more intricate and better relationship with each other. I hope you have the best day. And please remember to like and subscribe and to share the podcast, all those things that I'm sure you do anyway. And I just want to say thank you for that as well. Um, have a day of gratitude, please. Enjoy yourselves. And I very much look forward to chatting to you again really, really soon. Peace, love, and protein. High fives and positive vibes. Ciao!